Jesus. I'm interested in that. I underscored that and I thought I'd let you know, PMC, that you need here not to live any Christian life in isolation. We are connected in this fellowship. We belong in this fellowship. We, the purpose of the church, in if, to evangelize the world. But first and foremost, we must know what it means to exalt Jesus. And then to edify one another. Encourage one another in the faith. You know, just build up one another in Christ. So that we can be more effective when we go out in this world because of this wonderful companionship and within this companionship he senses the same heartbeat one of compassion one of passion and he was sending him to the philippian believers then the second one because of his communion of soul because of his communion of soul. That's why I'm sending him. Listen, listen to this. Listen to this. I have no one else like him. Who takes genuine interest in your welfare. You know, I looked at this and in the original language. You know what this communion of the soul suggests? In the Greek, one soul. Imagine Paul is saying... Timothy and I, one soul. We have the same heartbeat. We have the same interests. Yes, the same burning desire. And that is to see for the greater good that God be glorified. You know that that's how we need to look at ministry. All my leaders... And I'm here to remind them about that and all my members. Can I tell you, we might, we might catch a quarrel. But we have to stop quarrel at some point and understand there is one cause. And there's one goal. And it's one God. And it's one work. It's the work of the Lord. So we're just going to have to back off at times and realize that, listen... Is, is what we really going on with. This is the work of the Lord. Paul recognized this from where he sits. And he knew that it's about the Lord more than it is about him. And so he was saying, go tell them to rejoice. Go tell them to, 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 to joy in the Lord. Until I come see them. One soul. What's this talking about? One vision. Say one vision. one vision. One mission. Say one mission. One passion. One compassion. It's all about Jesus, you see. All about Jesus. The third thing. Why he wanted to send Timothy. Not just because of this wonderful, you know, companionship and, and communion that they, that they, that they um, share. This wonderful compassion that was in the heart of the brother. He, his care for the saints. Look at it. His care for the saints. He, he suggests that, listen, this man cares for the saints. He cares. And so, my brothers and sisters, there needs to be care for the saints. It sounds to me as if Timothy is rare. Huh? It sounds to me as if Timothy, there's a scarcity of Timothys in the church. For we need to care so much for one another that moves us to share with one another. And to be there for one another. You and I must understand what this means for the church. And brothers and sisters, we're going to have to begin to understand that we must do things 
together. When I call you to congregate at one spot and dispatch and share with some homes and some tracks and come back and share some testimonies and sing and preach. And when you use silent treatment on me, or you're just absent and you don't tell me you weren't coming. Tell me what that means. I don't know. I'm asking because you do me that already. Several times. You do me that in my first year and you do it in my second year. You're going to do it in my third year. I've seen some I've seen some people there, but and I'm saying, why don't we all just come and make an impact and make a mark? Am I telling anybody to do anything wrong? Anything that is unbiblical? Hold no silence, sir. Hello? You dead there? Eh? Now, I'm, I'm serious about ministry. I'm serious about ministry. If you cannot cross the ocean and you cannot preach like Paul... You can tell the love of Jesus. You can say he died for all. We're talking about how we can be example and how we can model. Huh? And how we can illustrate. And how we can just share our testimonies. And how we can just do things together. And if I'm going to become a quarrelsome person here, I'm going to quarrel when we can't do things collectively. Because a church ought to be collective in its undertakings in its efforts in its mission for unity is strength unity is strength so friends you hear me talk about arthritis earlier on and i'm saying i'm not just dragging you all over the place don't complain that pastor dragging me all over the place to keep street meeting or to share tracks I'm just ascend we upon down so don't complain. Because if you don't do it outright, it's pain I wait for you. <laughs> weak body, weak bones, weak joints, all kind of condition where you can't move again and you wish that you could be an upbeat for the Lord. Now I preach no bad news, no bad message, and I pray no imprecatory prayer for you, but it's the truth. Do what you need to do now for Jesus before you are hindered. It's not just the outright Spain waiting for you to you know, remember their judgment. You're going to have to give an account for not being a witness. Timothy always was somebody. Here's why he sends Timothy. He says Timothy is caring. Or oh, listen, Timothy is always holding others up timothy was known read everything you can about timothy read even the book that he read he wrote and you'll understand timothy was always holding up others always holding up others are you asking me pastor Cohen, how you expect me to hold up others now what you want me to do can't bother with people at times. You see, when you come into the community of faith, you can't talk like that. For we are one. God has made a difference in our lives. This is not a social club. This is not a rotary club. This is a church. And love of God must be felt and seen and demonstrated. And forgiveness and grace and you name it. It's all about grace. How do you expect to be forgiven when you can't and don't plan to forgive? Now, brothers and sisters, you're asking me how you can hold up somebody. What about the phone call? We have the technologies here now. What about that phone call? What about the text messages that we send by the hundreds or 200 free text messages? What about the email and the visit or the BB? What about listening? That listening ear that you need to give. 
What about just tarrying after church to talk to somebody and encourage somebody? This is what church is about. His care for the saints. He is the last one because of his commitment to the Savior. I'm sending Timothy because of his commitment to the Savior. He's always giving himself to evangelism. He's always on the road of evangelism. He's always about others. And you know, friends, that's what, that, that is what um, it results in when we commit to God. We'll be committed to church. We'll be committed to the service of God. We'll be committed to services that are called, whether on a Sunday morning or on a weekend or in the middle of the week. What is going to matter, friends, is our commitment to the Savior. Timothy seems to be exemplary in this commitment to the Savior. And the truth be told, friends, it, that is what matters. Commitment. That's what's going to make us rising stars. That's what's going to make us true examples. And so your commitment to the Savior is going to move you from comfort zones. Can I talk to you? From comfort zones to do something for Christ. Do you sometimes sit back to watch a show on television? Oh, they have one called Rising Stars too, don't it? That everybody want to pin down and watch and forget about the street meeting or the one-to-one -one evangelism. Do you realize that God has called you to be a rising star for him? And that you can't afford to allow any other stars to distract you? Do you realize, my brothers and sisters, that the shows and television should not hold you back when you're on a mission for the Lord because there is too much passion and your heart is full of the compassion that Jesus had. And you must do the will of God. I met some friends in the United States of America some time ago that I hadn't seen for decades. And one of the friends asked me, and you're still a minister? And I quickly responded, yes. And another one responded to me, aren't you bored? I said, no. Because if this was my choice, then it would be another story. God chose me. God chose me. And I'm excited about God's choice for me. Because we are prone to make the wrong choices in our lives. We are prone to, do, to think we are on the right road. I said, well, I may have some disappointments. I've said this to my friends. I may have some disappointments while I do ministry. I may have some disappointment. Then I'm bored. Or some people may really disappoint you. When they covenant to share ministry with you. And they are not there. Or they walk away like a Judas. Or they walk away like a Peter. And that's when I'm disappointed. In the lack of faith in God. In the failures. In the lack of firmness. When people become quitters. When they become poor examples. When they, be, when they live the life 
of falling over and not standing up. But we need more examples, more models, more illustrations, more of these testimonies. More examples like that of Christ or Paul or Timothy. But there's a last one. Exemplary life. Prisoner called Paul. A son called Timothy. And I close with this one. A brother called Epaphroditus. A brother called Epaphroditus. Not much could be said prior to this in scripture about Epaphroditus. But if you look at verse 25, you'll hear Paul now. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. Now, Epaphroditus was not an apostle. Epaphroditus was not a statesman. Epaphroditus was not an elder. Few Pauls, we would say, some Timothys, but many Epaphroditus. Sees. Ordinary man. But yet, an example. For he was steadfast and he was unmovable. Now, Paul's titles of him, my brother, which relates to, you know, the relationship that exists between them, not in any way biological, but he's talking about his brother in the Lord. And then he says, my fellow worker, relating to the ministry and the service that they encounter. And my fellow soldier, relating here to how he responds to the enemy. One thing we know is that Epaphroditus was one, a godly man. Two, he had a heart of a servant. They sent him to Paul to take care of all his needs. They thought that this was the best man to go for Paul. Paul has been a great pastor, a great minister, a great missionary. And they sent one of the best to take care of his needs. And the tables turn because now Paul is saying, I think the best man to come back that I send back to you at this point is Epaphroditus. So he was not just a godly man and a man with a heart of, of servanthood, but he was a man of great courage. You're talking about Rome. Look what happened to Paul. And this is where this man plans to be of service. He could easily be taken in and, and uh, you know, charged. Because he seems like a spy. You, you, you're going forth, you're going to and forth. Huh? What, what are you about? I, it makes sense I arrest you too. But this was a willing servant. He was, a, he was willing to leave it all. So that's the other thing we realize about him. He was a godly man. He was a heart of a servant. He was a man of great courage. And he was a man willing to leave it all. That is a man of great sacrifice. Well, that's what we're talking here. Sacrifice. That's what we're highlighting. Great sacrifice. My life is poured out too. Yet Paul was sending him back. That's what verse 28 is saying. 
Paul was sending him back. Therefore, I am all more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad. And I may have less anxiety. Welcome him back in the Lord. Welcome him like you would welcome the Lord. That's what Paul is saying. Welcome him with great joy. And then look, honor men like him. Speaking well of him, don't it? Because he almost died for the work of Christ. Risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Here is a man among men. Ordinary man. I told you he's no statesman. He's no apostle. He is no high profile man. An ordinary man. But because he was godly. And he has a heart of a servant. And a man of great courage. And was willing to lay it all down for God. That's what makes him great. Was a man very reliable bearer of gifts and messages trustworthy man in the philippian church they, they they never had to watch with another eye when he takes the offering they were not missing anything and they were willing to give him gifts to send to paul offerings to send to paul Found honest to collect, to check off, to distribute. And not lustful to lift it. He was a risk taker. A real risk taker. And you know that word for risk we understand is dice. You know like you're throwing dice. You're gambling. In other words, this man was willing to gamble his life for Christ. I was just captured by that. Indicative of how he offers himself. Ordinary man. Historians have also concluded that because he has the name Epaphroditus, that he never even had godly parentage. Because of his name, Epaphrodite, a goddess, huh? Yeah, a goddess. And, and what we understand is what again, the goddess of beauty, yes, or, 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 the, or the, 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 the goddess of it was not just beauty, there was something else. Good luck. Good luck. So he got his name from one of these. Gods. But this again tells the truth about the transforming grace of God. And that God can save anybody. And that God can use anybody. You may think you are not important. You may think it is some group in the church that must do evangelism. You are not um, the, the, the mouthpiece you are not the courageous you are not the whatever but have you ever thought of what it means to put your life on the altar and say God if you can use anything just use me I sense this was Epaphroditus his uh, commitment parents may not have known the Lord but the important thing is that I know the Lord. Now you heard he almost died, right? What was the reason for his close scrape with death? He was near death. You heard it. It was not a disease in his body. It's where he was placed. And where he served and how he served as he took risks without complaining, in humility, serving in lowly service. 
sacrificially with great joy for the Lord gambling his life and then almost died the martyr's death I want to ask you what are you risking your life for what would you gamble your life for what's your greatest joy you see Ep Ep Epaphroditus' greatest joy came in sacrifice came in sacrifice and because he was such a sacrificial person the church loved him Paul loved him a matter of fact read it for yourself at one time Paul Paul was saying um, the church is so distressed. He got news. Church is distressed. They, they, they heard that, that he is sick and, uh, and on to death. And they never had telephones to BB. They, they couldn't call. They couldn't fly over. They were in suspense, held in suspense. They were wondering what was going to be happening to this great servant of God. And now, amazing, church in distress for Epaphroditus but then guess what Paul was distressed Epaphroditus himself was in distress for the church when he heard and Paul was distressed because everybody was distressed everybody was interested about everybody's interests I mark that down relationship above ministries here Paul saw a need at this time to put relationship over agenda. And there comes the time in the church of God when we're going to have to pause to see how important it is to minister to one another. To put one another first on the agenda. To maintain good relationship. To foster good relationship with one another. Nobody was interested in self. Isn't that what we found in verses 2 and 3? Of this chapter? Yes. For earlier we had looked at it. Earlier we had looked at it. Then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Having the same love. Being in one spirit. And purpose do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit in humility consider others better than ourselves or better than ourselves each of you should look not only at your own interest but also to the interest of others and I thought of these two verses and I thought of the church interested in Epaphroditus Epaphroditus interested in the church Paul interested in everybody and so he said, I'm going to send back this servant to you. And this guy being such a great guy, who would want to send him back? But Paul was seeing the interests of others above his own. Relationship and ministry are not mutually exclusive. Let's not take relationship for granted, brethren. I've come here and you wouldn't know how I feel when I find that person's just set an appointment and come straight to my office from that year started to introduce themselves and to say, I'm with you. This is what I do. You can call on me. Oh, God. Encouraging. Pastor, here you talk about something more and I love missions. I love evangelism. I love children. I want to get on board. Oh, you wouldn't know what that means to me. Meeting people, people meeting me, what joy it brings in fellowship because we are one family. So for some of us, we still need to talk. We still need to share interests and ministries and burdens and sympathies and concerns for the greater good and for the glory of God. God has put us together to fulfill his purpose. Here are some shining stars. Can you be like them? 
Would you choose to be a prisoner and remain a shining star? Would you choose to be a son like Timothy, always holding others up because someone taught him how to sacrifice? Paul taught him how to become an offering poured out. Would you choose to be a brother or a sister? And Epaphroditus risking his life for the sake of Christ. There is this wonderful song that I was reminded of as I got to this closing point. Ready to suffer, grief or pain. Ready, my place to fill. Ready for service, lowly or great. Ready to go, ready to stay. Ready, my position to take. Are you ready? Here are some examples that can remain in a crooked and perverse world. A world that has scoliosis. A distorted world. Yet, we can remain exemplary. Why? For we are living out the Christian life through the power of Christ in humility without complaining and we're doing so sacrificially and with great joy bow your heads everybody While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and as we reflect on what God would have us to contemplate in this hour when we're considering evangelism, it's so important to win one more soul for Christ that can soon be uttered into eternity who might just get ill so quickly like Ricardo Hyman, short illness. But we're so glad that watch night he was in the pool with us. And he was saying, I've accepted Christ as my Savior, as he was being interpreted. And look, another December didn't catch him. But here you are now in the land of the living, though it's the land of the dying too. You don't know how much longer you would live. And you heard of a prisoner called Paul. You heard of a son called Timothy. You heard of a brother called Epaphroditus. And you taught... Perhaps my life can become like these. It's true, your life can. But you will have to, by faith, trust Jesus Christ to transform your life and to make it become exemplary in this crooked and perverse world. So, Pastor Cahoon, I think that you've spoke to me. The Spirit of God has confirmed it. And I'd like to commit my life to Jesus Christ right now. And I'd like to very soon be sharing the gospel like this. Is there anybody?
Raise that hand above your head and just take it down. Pray for me, Pastor Cahoon. For I want my life to tell for Jesus that anywhere I go, men may his goodness know. No, I want my life to tell for Jesus. I want it to remain on the annals of history. Raise that hand up now. I want my life to tell for Jesus. Three hands, four hands, five, six, any more, seven, any more. I want my life to tell for Jesus. That anywhere I go, men may his goodness know. I want my life to tell for Jesus. Yes, you may take them down now. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, upstairs. Anybody need to accept Jesus as Savior? Yes. Or as a Christian, you'd like to make a commitment? I want my life to tell for Jesus. Here's my life, Lord. Offering poured out. You've seen those hands, Lord. They're lives that you can use. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder and Mount and Calvary's Mount outpoured. There was the blood of the Lamb. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace, God. I pray that we will have some more exemplary lives like these we find in the scriptures right next to your example. We thank you that we can model you. We can tell the truth about you. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would move in this place right now. Speak to hearts. For we pray in no other name but in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Everybody standing, please. Lead me, Lord, I will follow. Lead me, Lord, I will go. You have called me. I will answer. Lead me, Lord. I will go. And as we begin to sing, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Sacrifices had to be put on the altar. That drink offering had to be poured out. Will you just demonstrate that now? By coming to this altar, yes, this is just an ordinary altar, but by faith, you come here. Here's my life, Lord. I'm not going to take that for granted. God can use anyone. Come now. Lead me, Lord. Lead me, Lord. I will. You raise your hand or you didn't raise your hand. Just come. Just come. I will go. You have called me. You have called me. I'm answering you today, Lord. I will answer. Lead me, Lord. Lead me, Lord. I will go. An offering before you. Lead me, Lord. I will follow. Lead me, Lord. I will go. You have called you me. You have called me. I will answer. Lead me, Lord. I will go. Let the Spirit move you today. Just come to this altar. Lead me. By saying, here's my life on the altar. I, will I want to be a mouthpiece, a mouthpiece for you. Lead me, Lord. I want to share my testimony I more. Go. I want to share my testimony you more. Called me. I will answer. 
He is my life, Give Lord. Me, Lord. Ah. Make me a mouthpiece for you. Lead me, Lord. I will follow. Lead me, Lord. Lead me, Lord. I will, I will go. You have called me. You have called me. Yes, Lord, I'll answer. I will answer. Lead me, Lord. Me, Lord. Me, Lord. I, will go. I will go. You have called me. I will answer. Lead me, Lord. I will go. You know, I was just about to, to give this microphone to Elder Bear Singh and, and to say to him, close the service, but you know the spirit bids me to make a final appeal a final appeal this this call is not just for unsaved it's a call for Christians because we've been dumbbells we've been we've remained ignorant we've we've closed our mouths and we've not been mouthpieces for the Lord we've been selfish we've been protecting our own interests you know we don't we don't even want to worship when we're sick we are complaining and here's one example that, that tells the truth about just praising god understanding what illness is and what this body we live in this old clay pot it can still be of service to god maybe you've been blaming some some aches and pain for not being on the go for God. Will you start going and see what God can do? Paul was busy in prison. Busy. Somebody wants to get busy for God? Hallelujah. Slip away and come. I don't think you should be standing there if you feel a prompting and an urge to come. Just come to this altar. I want to be an offering poured out. I want to live for Christ. I want to die for Christ. I want to serve Christ the best way I know how. I've been even prejudiced. I've never gone on one of the Haiti trips because I hear, you know, how terrible that can be. I have not gone into any place where, you know, it's not like Jamaica. And I could have gone. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not just thinking of a nice place. I want to go anywhere for God. Hallelujah. On a short-term mission. Somewhere. Anywhere. Slip away and come. I'm making myself available, Lord. Here am I. Send me. Use me. God, I want to learn a format to share the good news. I want to understand a verse and I want to wrap my testimony with that. And I want to do this more often, Lord. I have not been speaking for you. I want to begin speaking for you. That's the call. So if you still feel moved from upstairs or downstairs, I patiently wait. Because where are we going if God is calling us? Lead me, Lord. Anybody else? Oh, what a joy it is to see you take this stand for God. And Let's to give yourself a way to be poured out on the altar. I will answer. Here's my life, Lord. Here's my life, Lord. Before I die, here's my life. Me, Lord. I want to sing for you. I, will I want to intercede for you. Me, Lord. I, I want to speak for you. For you saved me. 
You have called me. Forgive me, Lord. I will for being complacent. I'm answering you now. Sing, you have called me. You have called me. And I will answer. I will answer. Lead me, Lord. Sing it one more time. You have called me. You have. I will answer. Lead me, Lord. I will go. I want to do something very strange, very unusual, because I don't know everybody. I'm going to ask those of us who are Christians and coming to make a, a fresh commitment to God. A step to the right. You are a Christian, but you want to go for the Lord. He's burning in your stomach. A step to the right. Which is your left? Those of us who have come for salvation. Just step to the right quickly. Those who have come for salvation remain to my left, which is your right. Deacon Scott, I'm going to need you. Elder Core, I'm going to need you. Some other 